What's up everybody, I'm Jason, and welcome back to this deep dive on time-lapse and hyperlapse photography. Now, so far we've looked at everything from the basics of what a time-lapse is, to how to prepare to shoot one, to setting up your Canon photo or cinema camera to actually shoot it. Now we're gonna look at some of the supporting hardware that you can use to transform your time-lapses into hyperlapses. And that brings me to the hardware that you see in front of me here. This is Edelkron's Slider Plus Pro, and of course, this is a DJI RS3 Pro gimbal. Now, I didn't buy either of these for their time-lapse capabilities specifically, or for time-lapse work specifically, but both have time-lapse capabilities that can be used, and we're gonna start looking at how to use them. So in this video, we are going to focus on using the Edelkron Slider Plus with both Canon's photo and cinema cameras. Before I get into the specifics of this hardware, specifically, we need to talk a little bit about how motion control hardware interacts with the camera when shooting time lapses. So almost every piece of motion control hardware, at least that I've seen, is designed to shoot time lapses as a series of still images. In fact, it's also designed to control the camera's shutter throughout this process. Now this approach has some implications that we need to be aware of. To start with, there's movement. Well, the movement of the motion control hardware, that is. Instead of moving slowly but continuously, most of these devices use a cyclical move, stop, shoot, then repeat the process pattern, where the camera is stopped at each shooting position and the shutter is then triggered. Now, this isn't a problem if you're using the motion control hardware to trigger your camera's shutter. However, if you're using the camera's internal timer, in say, time-lapse movie mode, and it doesn't match the motion control hardware setup, you will end up with a video that stutters when it plays back. Secondly, we have to consider how the motion control hardware is going to trigger your camera's shutter. This has not only implications not only on if we can actually use that hardware to control our camera, but also what modes that we have available to work with with that hardware. For example, Edelkron uses a simple remote release connection. This is the same kind of connection that you find on almost all photo cameras for a remote uh, cable release. Now, this is just a simple electrical circuit that's wired in parallel with the camera's shutter release button. Close the circuit, and the camera acts as if the same as if you would just press the shutter release. Now, while this is simple and effective, its functional functionality is limited, and it's not used on most cinema cameras. Instead, they use a much more complex logical and electrical system that allows the remote control to operate many more of the camera's functions. However, that solution is often either unsupported or presents its own set of problems with motion control hardware. Now, the other option that is implemented, and this is, for example, implemented by DJI, is to use the camera control APIs and connect to the camera with either USB or Bluetooth. Now, while this has some advantages in terms of greater extent of control over the camera, and you certainly will see that if you've ever used a DJI gimbal, it also is limited by what functions the camera manufacturers choose to expose in their API and which of those functions the motion control hardware maker chooses to actually implement, which ultimately may limit what you can do using that solution as well, even though it can potentially be much more powerful. Now, ultimately, how difficult or fiddly this process is depends on not just how much or how the motion control hardware is implementing things and what functionality your camera provides, but also just how you want the end results to be generated and whether you can actually use that process as well. So let's get to this slider and let's start by talking about the physical setup side of things. Now, I'm only gonna function, focus on the time-lapse specific stuff in this video, not every detail of the setup. If you're interested in that, I am working on a more detailed review that will be published in the near future. So first off, you need more than just the slider. You will also need the motor module, a power source for the motor module, the Edelkron app on your phone or tablet to coordinate everything, and an appropriate link cable to connect the motor module to your camera. Now, when it comes to power, 
normal battery power should be sufficient for most time-lapse uses. This is going to be especially true if you're using the larger Sony L series, or many people call them NPF series or style batteries, especially the 700 and 900 series in that uh, or type of those batteries. However, you can also use Canon LPE6s, which is what I have, an AC adapter, or if you want to, a 9 volt USB D power supply using a USB C to DC connector cable. Now, personally, as I said, I use Canon LPE6s. I don't the reason for this is that I don't want to have to carry multiple types of batteries with me when my tr when I travel and multiple chargers and so on and so forth. And I have found that even with their limited capability or capacity, I should say, compared to especially like Sony, uh, the larger Sony batteries, a pair of these batteries is still going to give me good, uh, it's still going to be good for something like a 12,000 frame time-lapse sequence, which is actually way more than I'm ever going to reasonably shoot in any given setup. Now, if you're going for the full multi-axis motion control setup with pans, tilt, slides, and all of that jazz, you know, the full Monty, I guess you could say, then you'll want to use Edelkron's heads since they're all tightly integrated and all of that hardware synchronizes and coordinates with each other and you will get the best possible results going it that way. Now, you could try to cobble something together like mounting a DJI Ronin on top of the Edelkron slider, and uh, I have, can't have to admit I have been tempted to try that, but it's also going to be a nightmare to make work well because nothing is coordinating or talking to each other. Now, if you just are using the slide movement for the slider, then you can use any tripod head on top of it to mount your camera on. However, for time lapses or hyperlapses in this case, you don't actually need a fancy fluid or video specific head since that fluid drag stuff is really there to give you smooth pans and tilts and you won't be moving the camera on the slider while the recording is going on. So those are all going to be kind of useless. In general, what I recommend is the lightest head that you can use is best. Lighter is definitely better, especially if you're working off of a tripod. So for me personally, I try to use the lightest head that I actually have or own. Typically, this is going to be a ball head, and it's going to be either something like this really small, uh, open one, or a just general, in general, a ball head since they tend to be lighter than the video heads. Now, regardless of head choice, if you are using a very heavy or very long lens that shifts the center of the balance from the lens and camera off away from the center of your slider, I have found that it is also really useful to use a nodal slide like you would use for shooting panoramas to shift the camera and lens off center, I guess you could say, or to center up the weight of the camera and lens over the slider. As designed, this slider is supposed to control your camera's shutter with a shutter release cable. However, Edelkron uses a very odd size 2.5 millimeter TRS or mini phone style connector for this instead of what's much more common, which is a three and a half millimeter version of the same. Now, the good news here is that while the size is a little wonky and not quite normal, Edelkron does use the de facto standard pinout for their connector. That is the tip of the connector controls the shutter release. The ring on the connector is the shutter half press function, which is usually going to be autofocus, and the sleeve is the ground that completes the circuit so the camera actually sees the button is being pressed. Now what this means is that if you already have a remote release cable that's terminated in the standard 3.5 millimeter connector, you can buy a cheap 2.5 to 3.5 millimeter adapter cable or connector and use it with the motor module. And in my testing, both three and four contact versions work, well, largely due to the way the connectors are designed to be backwards or interoperable. Now, if you're unsure of exactly what to use, I will put some links to the adapters that I've tested and I know work in the description below the video. Additionally, if you, even if you plan to use your camera's built-in time-lapse movie functionality, you might find it beneficial to use the link cable to start recording in sync with the slider. Though, if you do this, remember to disconnect the cable once the recording starts or when the slider goes to make the next frame, it will just end your recording prematurely.
There are two ways to set up your camera to shoot with this motion control system. You can either use the system or the motor module or really any of the Edelkron hardware to trigger your camera's shutter release or not. Now, all photo cameras with a remote release port can be connected to the motion control system to shoot still sequences that you'll have to assemble into a video in post. Unfortunately, most, if not all of these cameras will not be able to create a video in camera under the slider's control. Now, on the other hand, most cinema cameras don't have the simple remote release system that is found on a photo camera, and so they can't be either uh, controlled by the slider basically at all, even though many, or at least all of Canon's, have a frame recording video mode that would work perfectly. The one exception to all of this is the R5C. You can use it in either still mode, like any other photo camera, or you can use the frame recording special recording mode that's part of the video system to do exactly the same thing, but you get a video out of the camera and the slider is still in control. Now, if you're going to use the slider to control your camera's shutter, for everything but the EOS R5C, the camera must be put into photo mode. Beyond that, there is nothing special that you need to do beyond the normal time-lapse stuff that needs to be done anyway. Now, if you are going to shoot with a Canon camera and you are more want some more details about this, check out my video on shooting time-lapses in photo mode for more useful or more info on useful settings. Now, if you are using the R5C and you want to go the video rote, then you will need to put your camera into frame recording mode. Now, fortunately, I covered this in the video that I did on shooting time lapses with the R5C, so I'll link to that and you can check that one out as well. Now, while Edelkron's system wasn't designed to work with a camera's internal timer, under the right conditions, this approach also works just fine. Though, to have the best shot of things working well, here is what I have found. To start with, you need to use the same interval setting on both the camera and in the Edelkron app for your slider. This will prevent things from stuttering. Second, you'll want to use a longer interval than the slider's minimum of one and a half seconds, and you'll want to shoot a time lapse that lasts longer or takes longer than five minutes to record. The way the Edelkron slider works is that it tries to fit both the exposure time and the time it takes to move to the next position into the specified interval. However, if it can't move fast enough, then the interval will be lengthened in accordance to how long it needs, which also does have an impact on the fact that your video will be longer and not in the, at the speed up that you specified. Now, when the slider is releasing the shutter, shutter, this isn't really a problem because it's in control of your camera and it just changes things. But when you're using your camera's internal timer, then the camera will drift out of sync with the slider's movements and that's going to reduce the quality of your hyperlapse. Now, in testing, I found that as long as the recording time was longer than five minutes, any interval worked fine, even the minimum of one and a half second. But below that, I almost always ran into problems, even with comparatively long intervals like four or five seconds. Third, if your camera requires you to specify a frame count in the interval recording or time-lapse recording system, like the R5 does if you were using the time-lapse movie mode, add a few extra frames over what the Edelkron app calculates you'll need. Now, this isn't strictly necessary, but it does give you a bit of extra padding to manually start the recording, and in case things drift weird, have recording at the end as well. Now, finally, if you want to synchronize your recording with the slider as much as possible, you can plug the camera into the motor module and use the first frame to start your recording. Just make sure you disconnect the release cable after the first image is made, or the slider will stop your recording when it goes to make the second image. Finally, we get to the Edelkron app. Now, most of the settings in the time-lapse system in the Edelkron app should be pretty self-explanatory, especially if you've already looked at my other videos on time-lapses or you've done any time-lapse work before. Moreover, the app will calculate most of the settings based on what you fill out. So don't feel that you have to do something by hand. The, the, the app will work with you.
Now that said, setting the recording time and the playback frame rate are a minimum that you have to do. For the recording time, keep in mind that exceeding that time, uh, the recording may exceed that time if the interval time is short and the total recording time is short. We just talked about this. You get the idea. Stay at five minutes and longer if you can. Now, if you're shooting with a camera's internal time-lapse mode, you'll want to check that the recording time that the app calculates and the recording time that your camera calculates match, or are at least within a couple of seconds of each other. Now, for the frame rate, you should set this to the actual playback frame rate you intend to use, not necessarily what your camera may use in its automatic process. So, for example, Canon photo cameras like the R5 or R6 set the playback frame rate for time-lapse videos to 25 or 30 frames per second, depending whether you're shooting in PAL or NTSC mode, respectively. However, if you know you're actually going to use this at 24 frames per second, say you're going to take it into Premiere or Resolve or whatever, and tell that program that the actual frame rate of this file is 24 frames per second, then you'll want to set this the frame rate box in the Edelkrone app to 24 frames per second here. Now, for the rest of your recording settings, you can go about this a couple of ways. If you set the playback time, the app will automatically calculate the interval based on your recording time and frame rate. Alternatively, you could set an interval time or even a speed up, and the app will calculate the playback time for you based again on the interval or the recording time and playback frame rate. Now, since there is no communication between the app and the camera, aside from the shutter release signal, the software also needs to know how long your exposure time will be so that it can manage the movement and intervals appropriately. This is true whether you are using the release cable to control your shutter or you are doing it internally in your camera. Now, if you are shooting in full manual exposure mode, set this to match the shutter speed you've set on your camera. However, if you want to shoot in, say, aperture priority as a simple way to do essentially bulb ramping, as this course shooting in aperture priority, that is, will improve your ability to shoot into the edges of the day, so sunrise and sunset, then set this interval to the longest, or set the exposure time to the longest exposure time that you're going to allow the camera to use. Now, for most of Canon's photo cameras, the absolute maximum length of an exposure is 30 seconds when using either the mechanical shutter or the first curtain electronic shutter, and a half second when the camera is in fully electronic shutter mode. However, you can also set a defined or user-defined lower limit on the shutter speed with most of Canon's mirrorless cameras. Now, to do this on the R5, you're going to head over to the Custom Function 2 menu page and look for the Set Shutter Speed entry. In that menu, you'll be able to set the minimum shutter speed to anything between 30 seconds and 1 4,000th of a second in one-stop increments. Now, on other Canon cameras, the setting is going to be called the same thing or something very similar. It just may be in a different menu section. Now, of the rest of the controls, there's really only two that might not be readily obvious or aren't well explained in the documentation by Edelkrone. These are the static slash dynamic interval switch and the ramp switch. So the static slash dynamic interval switch controls where the interval time, whether the interval time is fixed throughout the entire time-lapse sequence, that would be static mode, obviously, or can change over the course of the time-lapse, that would be, of course, dynamic mode. Now, the intent of the dynamic interval mode is to allow you to build a speed ramp right into the time-lapse as you shoot it. Personally, and at least for the time kinds of time lapses that I shoot, I don't find this overly useful and I don't actually ever use it. I would much rather shoot the whole time lapse at a slower speed or overshoot it essentially, and then speed ramp it in post, even though doing that means there's gonna be more images taken and therefore the file is going to be bigger. But simply, the increase in file size just doesn't matter that much compared to the increase in control that I have in doing this stuff in post. 
Now at the bottom, you'll find a switch that also says ramp. This is actually a position ramp. Now, the difference here is that while a time ramp will affect the camera's perceived speed as it moves through the frame, it will also affect the speed of everything else. So clouds will speed up or the sun will speed up or people will move faster or whatever. However, the position ramping feature allows you to ease the speed of the camera move without impacting the overall speed of the thing that you are photographing in the time lapse. So you can use this to add an ease in or out of the time lapse so that it slowly ramps in and down in speed, or you could use it to slow down in the middle to linger around something that is important or interesting. Now, one final tip. As I've alluded to throughout this video, short time lapses, those on the order of about five minutes or less, can be problematic. However, for a time lapse that, that that is that short, in many cases, you can actually just use the slider's regular movement at the lowest speed, which is of course 1%, and shoot with your camera's timer or a timer plugged into your camera. Now on my Slider Plus Pro Compact, sliding across the entire range at 1% speed takes 564 seconds or around nine minutes. The time taken though scales with the size of the move. So if you only were gonna do half the length of the slider, then it would take about half the time. Now, of course, because of the compound sliding mechanism on the Slider Plus series, if you need half the length, but the longer time, you could also do that by using the slider on the ground instead of a tripod, which halves the length, but doesn't actually half the amount of time it takes to run it. So. I think I'm gonna wrap this one up here. Of course, if you have a question or if you have one of these and you use it for time lapses and have a tip that I didn't cover, drop it in the comments below. If you found this useful or at least interesting, let me know by hitting that like button. And of course, share this video. If this kind of thing seems like it might be your kind of thing, please consider hitting that subscribe button if you haven't already. Finally, if you'd like to directly support this channel and future content like this, please consider hitting that thanks button if you can or buying yourself something you've always wanted from the affiliate link in the description below. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.